At 6 p.m. on a Monday here in Korea, welcome to our newscast. I'm Daniel Che. Let us begin with the headlines. President Macron vows to revise Korea's constitution, pointing to difficulties in running state affairs under the current single-term presidency system. The Financial Action Task Force is the latest to join global efforts to reign in North Korea. The international organization dedicated to fighting money laundering is calling on member nations to help cut off the North's sources of cash. South Korea's foreign minister emphasizes the need to up the pressure on the North to denuclearize at a ceremony to mark the 71st UN Day, which is also Seoul's 25th anniversary as a UN member. Our starting point this evening is the president's policy address to the National Assembly. She announced the government will begin the process of revising the constitution to change Korea's one-term presidency and pledge to have the process completed by the end of her term. Song ji Sun has our top story. President Park has vowed to put the revision into effect before her single five-year term ends, citing the outstanding difficulties she has experienced over the past three years and eight months she's been in office. She said the challenges facing Korea cannot be tackled with just a handful of policies or reforms, and that the revision must be approached with the next century in mind. Chisokanangan President Buck said that the single-term presidency can no longer serve the needs of a changing society and said, now seemed the right time and place to answer the call from the public and the political realm to go ahead with the revision. Public polls indicate that 70 percent of Korean people agree with the idea of revising the constitution and nearly 200 lawmakers, or two-thirds of the total, are engaged in a parliamentary movement to proceed with the revision. 저는 오늘부터 개헌을 주장하는 국민과 국회의 요구를 국정 과제로 받아들이고 개헌을 위한 실무적인 준비를 해 나가겠습니다. 임기 내에 헌법 개정을 완수하기 위해 정부 내에 헌법 개정을 위한 조직을 설치해서 국민의 여망을 담은 개헌안을 마련하도록 하겠습니다. President Buck also asked lawmakers to set up a special parliamentary committee and to gather public opinion on the issue to further develop and discuss the scope and content of the tasks ahead. On what kind of governance structure the president has in mind, the presidential office said that the decision should be made through open discussion with the public and the politicians, but added that the president should take the leading role in that process. Song ji Arirang News. As expected, there was a clear divide along party lines when it comes to lawmakers' reactions to the president's proposal to revise the constitution. Our Park Ji-won fills us in on the statements issued by Korea's main political parties. The ruling Senuri Party welcomed the president's address, particularly her pledge to move forward with revising the constitution, which currently stipulates a single five-year term for presidents. The party said now is the time to start discussing the matter to reflect both the changes in society and the challenges of the future, and he vowed to gather public opinion on the matter. The Henry Party vows to faithfully take up the revision issue by listening to experts and the public for Korea's bright and hopeful future. The main opposition Democratic Party of Korea criticized the president's sudden change in stance on the issue. It said it cannot accept the revision proposal now when the top office is marred in corruption allegations. It accused the president of using the revision to shift attention away from the allegations, especially when she hasn't yet offered a response. The top office is facing allegations related to a woman who is accused of using her ties to the president to raise funds for two foundations. It is also fending off corruption allegations against senior presidential secretary Oh Byung-woo. 
President Park flatly rejected the constitutional revision two years ago. She said it would ruin the economy because revision discussions would eclipse every other issue like a black hole. She made the issue taboo. Thus, we cannot accept the authenticity of the revision proposal. The minor opposition People's Party said it welcomes the revision, but it too was critical of the move. Echoing the main opposition party, it questioned the president's timing and asked why the presidential office would move forward with the revision now after having ignored the opposition bloc's requests for so long. It's a bit fishy that the president would propose a revision at this time because it seems that the presidential office would want to cover up the recent stirring of corruption allegations against it. The party added that a constitutional revision is not a cure-all and not every problem in the nation's political realm has originated with the document. It concluded by urging the top office and the ruling party to focus on more urgent issues. Park Ji-won, Arirang News. We now turn our attention to a meeting between a North Korean diplomat and an ex-U.S. government official that raised question marks over the weekend. Washington confirmed that event took place without its involvement. Though talks have revolved around the nuclear issue, both sides only reiterated long-held positions on the matter. Kim Yeon-bin tells us some more. The United States says that it had no part in the recent talks between North Korean diplomats and former U.S. government officials in Malaysia over the weekend, calling it a private Track 2 meeting. North Korea's Vice Foreign Minister Han sang yeol and the North's U.N. Ambassador Chang yid hoon met Friday and Saturday in Kuala Lumpur with former U.S. nuclear negotiators Joseph D. Chaney and Robert Gallucci, who negotiated a landmark 1994 nuclear freeze deal with Pyongyang, and Asian affairs expert Leon Siegel. U.S. State Department spokesperson Anna Ritchie Allen on Sunday dismissed any affiliation with the meeting, saying that, quote, Track 2 meetings are routinely held on a variety of topics around the world and occurred independent of U.S. government involvement. The rare meetings drew global attention as they could be a sign of the North's willingness to come back to negotiations with the U.S. Siga told Sobe's Jeonap News that meeting was mainly focused on the nuclear and missile issue, but that only partial progress was made. He said the North reiterated that it wants to sign a peace treaty with the U.S. before halting its nuclear and missile programs, while the former U.S. officials reiterated that the regime needed to scrap its nuclear program first. Siegel added that he doesn't expect any official dialogue under the Obama administration, but said that the next U.S. administration will need to take a new approach to North Korea policy. Kim Hyun-bin, Arirang News. South Korea's top diplomats stressed the critical role of the U.N. and its members in dealing with North Korean provocations while expressing hope the organization will help bring peace and security to the Korean Peninsula. Kwan Soa shares with us his remarks at a ceremony marking the 71st anniversary of the United Nations. South Korean Foreign Minister Yoon Byung-se condemned North Korea's continuous provocations, saying extraordinary circumstances require extraordinary responses and that half measures would no longer do. He made the remarks Monday at a ceremony in Seoul marking the 71st anniversary of the United Nations. Since early this year, North Korea conducted two nuclear tests and fired 24 ballistic missiles of all types. When you add reprocessing, this constitutes at least 27 manifest violations of relevant UN Security Council resolutions by North Korea this year alone. This is unprecedented in the history of the United Nations. The minister said there is a new wave of global pressure against the North's advancing nuclear weapons development and an increasing number of UN members are scaling back their ties to Pyongyang. He also said it's no wonder the U.S. is stressing that premature dialogue with North Korea will only validate Pyongyang's wrongdoing. The remark appeared to be aiming at shaking off speculation that a recent meeting between current officials from North Korea and former officials from the U.S. could lead to further dialogue, which would go against Seoul and Washington's stated desire for denuclearization first, then talks. Minister Yoon also made reference to President Park Geun-hye's address at the National Assembly, echoing her pledge that the government and the international community would do their best through tougher sanctions and greater pressure to leave North Korea with no other option but to denuclearize.
This year marks the 25th anniversary of both Korea's UN membership. Seoul's top diplomat pointed out there could be no bigger contrast when looking back at the path the two Koreas have taken. Minister Yoon said he hopes the UN would be a good partner in bringing peace, security and eventually unification to the Korean Peninsula. Kwon Soa, Arirang News. The Financial Action Task Force, an international anti-money laundering body, is getting tough on North Korea. It adopted a statement urging member nations to suspend all foreign exchange transactions with the regime. Lee min -young has this report. The Financial Action Task Force, which fights international money laundering, is calling for a tougher financial sanctions against North Korea in line with the latest UN Security Council resolution. At a meeting in Paris Friday, the FATF adopted a statement calling on member countries to drastically tighten measures at home to cut off cash flows to the north. The FATF is an intergovernmental body aimed at combating money laundering, terrorist financing and related threats to the international financial system. Its 37 member states include the U.S., China, Japan and Russia. It urged members to shut down all North Korean banks, corporations and local branches set up within their countries. It also called on members to pull the plug on all forms of foreign exchange transactions with the reclusive state. Friday's statement was stronger than the one the FATF adopted in June's meeting in the South Korean city of Busan. In that statement, it asked states to closely inspect North Korea-related financial transactions. At Friday's meeting, South Korea also agreed to create a trilateral body with Japan and China aimed at stopping money laundering and terrorist financing. Lee min -young, Arirang News. A local advisory firm shared its two cents on the power transfer of Samsung. It advised shareholders of Samsung Electronics to oppose the nomination of Vice Chairman Lee Jae-yong to the Board of Directors. In a letter to its shareholders, Sustin Vest said Lee is not qualified because he has been a beneficiary of internal trading at Samsung Group. The only son of hospitalized Samsung Group Chairman Lee Gun-hee was nominated to join the board last month. And this will be able to put to a vote at a shareholders meeting on Thursday. Sustin Vest added such transactions undermine the company's value as it rules out the possibility of better transactions. This marks the first potential opposition to E's nomination. Last week, Korea's National Pension Service, the single biggest shareholder of Samsung Electronics and Institutional Shareholder Services, another advisory firm, signaled they would vote in favor of E joining the board of directors. The city of Incheon hosted this year's Korea Drone Championships over the weekend, which brought countless drone hobbyists and racers to the arena. But according to Hwang Wojin, it was also an opportunity for people to learn how this fairly new technology is about and already expanding into people's everyday lives. Take a look. From kids to adults, they've all got one thing in common, their love for high-tech drones. On Saturday and Sunday, Drone enthusiasts gathered at the 2016 Korea Drone Championship at the Incheon ASEAN Main Stadium. It's the first drone championship and the biggest to be sanctioned by the Ministry of Land, Infrastructure and Transport. With thousands of people participating, the event was more than just a race for unmanned flying objects. The drone business is highly strategic, with potential for an immense synergy effect. It's not only limited to leisure and sports, but can be applied to various fields, including logistics, art and conservation. And, as proof of the minister's comment, a series of demonstration and performances took place in the opening ceremony, all different in shape and functions, but all used in real life. Drones are already widely used in the agricultural sector, helping farmers spray pesticides without risking their own health. They are also used in facility inspections, especially in places relatively difficult to reach. Experts also say that in agriculture and industry, drones are more economical than manned vehicles. They say that's the main reason for a boom in the drone industry over the past five years. Moreover, entertainment-wise, Experts credit a change in the general public's view of these personal flying machines, helping drone racing gradually become a legitimate competitive sport. The drone industry is growing exponentially compared to that of radio-controlled devices, which has already been out there for a while. 
The difference is people and the government don't consider drones merely as toys. Rather, they see them as a business opportunity. It's similar to what Formula One racing is to the auto industry. The 2016 Korea Drone Championship offers more proof that drones are no longer the exclusive property of the military. Rather, drones have become an entertaining and accessible technology for the regular people as well as industries. With more deregulation efforts underway, sky is the limit for the future of drones. Hong Woo-jun, Arirang News, Incheon. On this day, 71 years ago, the United Nations was formed through a charter ratified by 51 countries to establish peace and security around the world. To commemorate the occasion, the UN Orchestra is here in Korea throughout the week to present a series of concerts. Our Woo Young was there. Peace, fraternity and unity. These core values of the United Nations resonate in the air at the Music for Peace concert in Seoul. Monday is UN Day, which marks the founding of the organization 71 years ago on October 24th. The UN Orchestra is here from Geneva to perform in various Korean cities to mark that historic date. The UN Orchestra, based in Geneva, is composed of some 60 musicians who work at the UN or its affiliated organizations. It aims to raise funds for charity and showcase UN principles around the world through the universal language of music. We believe in multilateralism. We believe in global communication, uh, partnership, um, effective dialogue between member states. Music has that power to reach uh, everyone, regardless of where they are from, or where, they, where they were born, um, what their background is. And music also has a very powerful uh, way of connecting people to each other. So music for peace makes, makes sense. The repertoire begins with an inspiring rendition of the anthem Ode to Peace and a powerful performance of Tchaikovsky's Symphony No. 5. The concert wraps up with Korea's best loved folk song Arirang. This universality of music, of the musical language, uh, it's, it, it, it has been written in, in Korea, in North Korea, and it's played now in South Korea, it has been played in, in Geneva, and it touched everyone. Everyone who came in this concert to listen to Arirang in Geneva said, wow, what a wonderful music, which means that there is, there is no need of explanation of the text. It's sad, not sad. People said, wow, it touched me. Music for Peace concerts will also be held in the southern cities of Gwangju and Busan throughout the week. The concert series also highlights the UN's presence in Korea, with an exhibition featuring the participation of various related agencies. Korea benefited from the UN and Korea intends to give back to the international community through the United Nations. We have now about 14 to 15 UN offices in Republic of Korea. That is a testament to Korea's desire to not only give back to the rest of the world, but to work with the United Nations very strongly. This year marks the 70th anniversary of the World Federation of United Nations Associations, the organiser of this event, in addition to marking South Korea's 25th anniversary of becoming a UN member state. Oh Soo-young, Arirang News. And that concludes our newscast for this hour, but we have more domestic updates for our viewers in Korea coming right up. Thanks for watching. Thanks for staying with us. I'm Devin Whiting with more of your domestic news. Suspicion of corruption at two government-linked foundations, Mir and K-Sports, continues to rise, especially concerning Che sun Shih, a close confidant of President Park geun The nation's prosecutors have expanded the team looking into the case with one of the new members having prior experience in a very high-level corruption probe. Kwon jang has this report. Suspicion is growing that the Mir and K-Sports foundations used shady methods to raise funds worth around 70 million U.S. dollars from big companies in just a couple of months. Prosecutors are intensifying their probe into the organizations by assigning to the case more corruption specialists. The Seoul Central District Prosecutor's Office on Monday dispatched three more prosecutors to the team of four that have already been working on it. The team is known to be experienced, one of them having helped follow the financial transactions of former President Chun Doo-hwan and also worked on seizing his assets back in 2013. 
The move comes as suspicions around President Park Geun-hye's long-term associate Che Soon-sil and Che's daughter Chong Yura escalate by the day. Prosecutors have been summoning figures to find out more about how the two foundations were established and subsequently managed. Prosecutors are also looking into how the Mir Foundation and K Sports Foundation are linked to two paper companies, VDEC and the Blue K, which were set up by Che and are based in Germany and Korea. Kwon Jang Woo, Arirang News. In other news, Korean consumers are tightening their belts amid the protracted economic slump. Statistics Korea reports that in the second quarter, a fifth of households say they spent more than their disposable income. The 20 percent figure is the lowest since related data was collected for the first time in 2003. It also beats the previous record low of 20.8 percent logged in the third quarter of last year. Household disposable income is the amount of money a household can spend after taxes and welfare contributions. The proportion of households spending more than that amount hit its peak back in 2005. The decline, experts say, is largely due to concerns over weak economic growth, despite government-led measures to boost consumption. The government predicts the economy will grow 3 percent next year, while the central bank has revised its outlook down to 2.8 percent. When it comes to retail sales in the travel sector, the world's number three spot goes to Lotte Duty Free for the second year in a row. According to the Moody Davitt report from the UK, Lotte's sales last year came behind those of Switzerland's Duffery and the Hong Kong-based DFS Group. And while it was able to stay ahead of France's LS Travel Retail, it was a much closer call than the year before, with a difference of $22 million. Lotte's goal of achieving the top spot by the year 2020 is looking more remote, not only because it lost its license to operate its World Tower location in Seoul last year, but also because incumbent leader Duffery has expanded its reach by acquiring Italy's World Duty Free. And those are some of the stories we're following at this hour. Thanks for watching. We'll be back at 8 p.m. Korea time.